But welcome back. Thank you to uh, the presenters, uh, the question posers, and to everyone who facilitated the first uh, of today's sessions. Uh, thank you for getting this conference off to such a great start. And I am truly sort of honored, thrilled, delighted uh, to welcome uh, someone who I have to introduce as not just science fiction author, uh, renowned science fiction author, Morris Broadus, but renowned Indianapolis science fiction author, Morris Broadus, although he has a, a long story uh, that uh, gets him here. And that in itself is a fascinating one. And not just because I know he has planned to weave some of his own story into what he shares with us today, but also because of the vibrant discussion of spoilers in the chat during the first session. Uh, I won't say too much about that in detail. Uh, I'm guessing that if you are a fan of science fiction in general, uh, Afrofuturism in particular, uh, Black Panther, you are familiar with something that he has written. Uh, hopefully, in the process of becoming a fan of his writing, you've also discovered how active he is in uh, the local community, in uh, nonprofits, in emphasizing you know, the, the value of the library and of education. And in fact, uh, he is in an educational setting right now, which I'm sure he'll say more about, but do want to say at the outset, by way of introduction, lest it be forgotten later, if you hear a bell at some point, it is not an indication that the conference has drawn to a close. Um, let Morris continue speaking and don't interrupt him at that point and certainly don't disappear on him. But our life stories, we found as we when we first uh, connected and had conversation, uh, passed through some similar points, although not in the same order or for the same durations. And there's these fascinating points of overlap as well as you know, really fascinating differences in our uh, religious and spiritual journeys. But we first encountered each other and first got introduced as a result of a common friend and shared interest in science fiction. And I think probably the first proper introduction was uh, when a, a mutual friend on uh, social media on Facebook had uh, posted something and it was somehow related to the fact you know, that you know, you'd seen that somebody else was, uh, had assigned something you'd written in their course. And so I quickly chimed in and said, I see an opportunity here and mentioned the fact that I had assigned uh, a, a story as well, uh, Voices of Martyrs, which has this fascinating exploration of evangelism and other things in it. And I was so glad I did because we had a chance to chat. Uh, because of COVID, we still uh, owe each other sort of in-person coffee and other things that uh, we'll get caught up on later. But I was delighted to see, not least, that uh, there are people in, um, in the chat already indicating that they're running out now and buying Morris's works on Kindle. Um, whether they'll have them read by the time you're done with your remarks, I doubt that because there's so many of them. But I'm glad that you're going and they're going and checking them out. Uh, I will add a, a word to say that that kind of multitasking while someone is speaking is, is certainly allowed during a conference, um, as are, of course, many others. So Morris, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And thank you in advance for uh, what you're going to share with us today. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. I, I am uh, in my uh, classroom at, at, a, at the middle school. Um, and so, yeah, there will probably be a dismissal bell at, uh, at in about a half hour, but it's a dismissal bell for the students, not, not for you all. Um, so again, uh, uh, thanks for the, that introduction. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm always uncertain how best to introduce myself, to be honest with you. Um, currently, I say that, you know, I'm a writer, I'm an Afrofuturist, and I'm a teacher. Um, but, you know, having trained as, a, as an artist, and as a scientist, and as a theologian, you know, the, the, those th three areas sort of encapsulate the way that I, I move through life in search of truth. So uh, let me start by saying that, uh, you know, I, I may have a broader definition of faith than some folks. Um, I've always contended that uh, everyone believes in something and, and we all possess a, a, a worldview which helps us navigate life, you know, and, and all developing worldviews, you know, what we choose to uh, put our belief in uh, as, as we interpret the universe around us, you know, they all, all begin with a leap of faith. And so for some, you know, that central faith, that, that central belief is, uh, is in ourselves, you know, be it the individual, or, or in humanity, or for some, it might be in science, you know, this determination, you know, driven by our senses or reason or, or what we can prove. And, and for some, um, it's the spiritual uh, and with the conceit that there's more to this life than, than that's, than that's being presented. And 
uh, there might be this unseen world as well as this uh, possibility of a life uh, after this one. And I'm, actually, I don't even know I'm explaining that to, to you guys. I think I, I do that in my head, mostly because I'm used to talking at science fiction conventions. And I, I have a best friend, his, his name is Rath James White, who's this atheist. And we always go at this like toe to toe every time we're on the panel together. So it's like I'm just trained to just automatically start to, you know, couch my story in these sort of terms. But um, so, so let me let me just go ahead and say, you know, my favorite episode, and I think some folks touched on, on, on part of this quote earlier, but my favorite episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Yeah, there we go. Um, which, and by the way, Star Trek Deep Space Nine is the best iteration of Star Trek. I will fight you on this in Jesus name, just so you all know. Uh, but anyway, my favorite episode is, is one called uh, Far Beyond the Stars. And so in it, Cisco, Captain Cisco wakes up in the 1950s as a sci-fi writer. And uh, during the course of the story, he encounters this preacher that tells him, you're the dreamer and the dream. And, and this is how I, I uh, that quote just haunted me uh, when, I, when I first heard it. But it's also how I tend to, to come at my own writing career, you know, both the dreamer and, and the dream of my ancestors. And I say that because I grew up in a, in a conservative fundamentalist church. Um, we just moved to Indianapolis. And as James alluded to, it's a bit of a long story. I was actually born in London. And then in early my childhood, we moved from uh, London, England to the thriving metropolis of um, Franklin, Indiana, uh, which was definitely was not, no, uh, not any culture shock involved in that whatsoever. And then we moved from Franklin to Indianapolis. And so when we had moved to Indianapolis, we were the first black family in our neighborhood. Uh, but our mom insisted that uh, you know, we had to go to church. And so she, she sent us with her coworker who also lived in, in the same community. And, and I hope you caught that part. She sent us. She didn't go, but she's like, all right, kids, off to church, you all go. So anyway, um, the first time I was kicked out of Sunday school class uh, was due to me attempting to come to terms with the story I just heard. You know, we had this uh, grandmotherly uh, Sunday school teacher and she just read the story of Noah and the flood and on the wall behind her was this, uh, you know, flannel graph on which there was like this fabric uh, arc and a, a fabric Noah bob bobbing on a, a fabric floodwaters. And, uh, and she invited each of the students to, to place an animal onto the ark. And so, you know, the pastor's son went up and he put a lion on the ark and then his buddy went up and put on a giraffe. And then when it was my turn, you know, I took a couple of the other fabric people and I, I laid them on top of the waters. And she asked me what I was doing. And I said, that, that is the story I just heard, right? And then uh, out of class I went. Uh, but, you know, I didn't realize at the time that this was the beginning of me wrestling with, uh, well, with, with a post-apocalyptic narrative, right? Uh, and trying to reconcile the uh, idea of what all that entailed with my faith. Uh, and it probably also stirred my uh, interest in, in dark stories, uh, which I guess don't tell my old church that. But all right, so only now do I, uh, you know, looking back, I, I realized what sort of pivotal moment this would be in, in my life, uh, besides beginning a, a track record of being kicked out of Sunday school classes and churches. But also, um, another Sunday school teacher heard of this incident and invited me to hang out with him, right? Now, uh, this was a more innocent age, I suppose, because. You know, we didn't think of anything of it. You know, he and I had pizza and then we talked and then he said, hey, I have something to show you. And so we go back to this back room. And again, I'm gonna emphasize this is a more innocent age, uh, but he opens this door and, and my life was forever changed. You know, cause this room is filled with like Doctor Who and Star Trek and uh, all these episodes are on VHS. And there's all sorts of uh, superhero memorabilia and, and rows and rows of comic books. And then he turns to me and goes, yeah, I think you're one of us. And, and this was like a, 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 I don't know, a, a Paul on the Damascus Road type situation for me, right? Uh, so in high school, you know, I go on and I uh, sort of pursue this interest in writing um, and accrue a, a comic book collection of about 10,000 by this point. 10,000 comic books, yes. Uh, and, but then once I went to college, I quit writing for about two years because my mother insisted uh, that I, she, how'd you put it? She, she didn't want to pay for me to have a creative writing degree, but instead she wanted me to do something respectable. And uh, to her mind, respectable meant nursing. Uh, and so we had to compromise and the compromise was me uh, being a biology major. 
And, and so, and that was fine. I, I pursued that for a while, but after a while I realized I, I had to write. You know, there was something in me that compelled me to pick up a pen and, and, and keep telling stories. And so all of my electives went to the, went to creative writing courses, but you know, there was still part of me was like, I don't know if this is what I was meant to do. But, so in my last year of, uh, of, of school, I took this independent study course. And, and in that course, you get randomly paired with a, a professor and I was uh, paired with uh, Dr. Edwin Casebeer. And when I told him my interest in horse and writing horror stories, you know, he asked if I'd researched him at all. And I was like, no. And then, then he got this weird smile on his face, right? And he informed me that, you know, hey, by the way, I did my dissertation in Stephen King and Clive Barker. And then, yeah, that was one of those nudges, you know, lets me know, hey, you know what? You might be on the right path. Uh, and then under him, you know, I went on, uh, he encouraged me to, to, to write and, and enter contests and, and, and under his tutelage, I ended up getting a, this honorable mention in the Asimov's Award for undergraduate writing. And, and that actually was for a story called Kali's Dance Macabre, which is about a man who, who falls in love with the goddess Kali. So I say all that, you know, the hardest thing for a writer to do actually is to figure out their, their unique, authentic voice. And, and so while I was in high school, you know, I imprinted on, on, on like Edgar Allan Poe. He, he was my, my go-to. Uh, by the time I got to college, it was like Stephen King and, and Neil Gaiman. But, you know, I was still trying to figure out who I was. You know, I was black, still am. Um, I was a Christian and spoiler, still am. Uh, but I was in the process of discovering, you know, what, the, what, what do those things mean to me, it, it, both in my life and in my writing? You know, so I had writers like Octavia Butler with her Parable of the Sower and Walter Mosley with Futureland and, and Toni Morrison with Beloved, and they were shaping my idea uh, of what it meant to be a Black writer. But, you know, weaving my faith into, into, these sort of, in, into, the, in this, into this picture, you know, that was a whole different struggle. Um, I should probably point out that I'm a, I guess one of the ways I would uh, define myself would be as a skeptical Christian, which I know may sound a little contradictory, but it's the best way I have to describe uh, how I leave room uh, for doubt and, and to question in, in my faith. Um, and th that being said, you know, one of the earliest decisions I had to make was whether or not I wanted to be a Christian writer or a writer who was a Christian, uh, because that decision was actually going to set the, the trajectory of my, my career in, in many ways. And uh, the church I'd grown up in, you know, they had a, would you say, a contentious relationship with uh, pop culture and art on, on its best day. Um, and then when I told them, you know, I had this interest in writing horror, where obviously my work was seen as being of the devil and, and glorifying evil. And so their, their, so their definition of, of storytelling and, 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 and everything meant that uh, the only valid version of that was, was if it had like, like this redemptive art or this, this proselytizing art. Uh, uh, and I'm just like, that, that's not what I want to do. That's not what I want my art to be about. Um, and, and frankly, Christian fiction was just something I just had no interest in writing. Um, so then after I had that decision settled, um, the issue then came, well, well then, all right, so if I'm going to be this writer who is a Christian, what does that, what does that mean? You know, how, how am I gonna weave my faith in an authentic way in, into my work? And, and, and issues of faith mattered a lot to me. You know, I'm, I'm always fascinated by uh, how, how these sort of themes are, are explored in fiction, you know, and, and it's, it's been something that while I thought about it a lot, I had kind of shied away from, from doing it in my fiction. Um, I wanted to explore faith in some of my stories, but I, you know, I didn't have any sort of framework uh, on, on how to do that. Uh, how, how, you, how would you explore that in, in a way that didn't amount to essentially Christian propaganda? So, so I turned to where many people turn when they have moments of spiritual crisis, Stephen King. And, and actually specifically his book, Desperation. And so here's the thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize when, when they think about Stephen King or, 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 or his stories is that he often wrestles with God and religious themes in a lot of his works. I mean, a lot of his works. Um, and in the, the book, Desperation, that it, this is where it sort of crystallized for me in, in particular. And now the story is fairly straightforward. You know, it takes place in Desperation, Nevada. It's a small rural town, you know, run by an insane sheriff. And the sheriff lures and traps passing tourists, terrorizing them, you know, as part of a homicidal spree, you know, as one does. Uh, now, ordinarily, 
this would be the standard escape from a madman type thrill ride. However, King decides that he's going to do this like deliberate meditation on the idea of spirituality as a means to defeat evil. Okay. And so like when, when the captured tourist is, is he's a young boy whose name is David, uh, David Carver. And, and he'd recently come into a special relationship with God. Uh, he, his friend was dying and David prayed, you know, if you heal my friend, I will do your will. And then this miracle happened and his friend was healed. However, then the main theme then becomes how that faith, well, I guess the rest of the story is sort of explores, you know, how that faith is tested and how it's sustained. And there's a central idea that uh, people either live in a state of faith or they live in a state of desperation. And that becomes the overarching theme of, of the story. And what I love so much about it is that there are no simple answers, right? The, the, the idea of prayer as a weapon is, is questioned and explored. Uh, Davy has to wrestle with uh, this question, uh, with this issue of uh, how a, a good God could allow evil to run so rampant. And yet he also has to trust that God has an ultimate plan. And that in some way he has to, he has to confront evil himself and, and respond to the reality of, of evil. And so, so David becomes this character, this fully developed character. And, and it's all done through this lens where, that he, where, how he interprets the world and this framework that uh, on how he sees the world and how the world responds to him. He's aware of, of what he believes and why he believes it. And, and this worldview that he has is, is respected and treated respectfully. And, and it's given the sense of depth and meaning which services the story, the theme and the plot. <laughs> so the, this novel started me thinking about the, the greater implications of, of, of stories in general, actually, you know, about how you could almost define religion as a, as a story or, or our text as a collection of stories that people believe in and, and are shaped by. And so this whole idea of, of combining uh, faith with fantasy, you know, it's not, it's not like it's been anything new, right? You know, it's been a vital part of many writers' works, you know, uh, 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 G.K. Chesterton with uh, The Man Who Was Thursday and C.S. Lewis, obviously, with uh, The Chronicles of Narnia and, and J.K. Rowling with, throughout the Harry Potter series. And uh, such treatments, you know, don't even have to be positive, right? Because uh, you got you know, Philip Pullman's His Dark, uh, His Dark Materials trilogy. Turning to, to science fiction in particular, uh, you know, you have uh, The Cant Canticle of Leibowitz by Walter uh, Miller, um, and that's a story about, in case you don't know, about monks who in this Catholic uh, monastery who, you know, take up this mission of preserving uh, the surviving remnants of man's scientific knowledge after a nuclear war, or uh, uh, Mary Doria Russell's The Sparrow, which I absolutely love, absolutely love this book. Um, and it follows this uh, Jesu Jesuit missionary trip to an alien planet. And, and this missionary trip just goes horribly, horribly wrong. Um, I cannot say enough good things about the sparrow, but it was in Stephen King's desperation. That was my first time seeing it done. And again, my biggest lesson from, from all of this was a basic one. You know, writers have a job to do, so do it well. You know, desperation drove home the fact that writers have to service the story first, not the message. Um, we have to create well-rounded characters, have a world for them to explore, you know, one that challenges their worldview. We get to ask difficult questions, but we allow the reader to wrestle with them. And so for me to boil down to, you know what? Do your job as a writer and then trust in the power of story after that. So then uh, for the next decade or so, you know, I worked as an environmental toxicologist. Um, the job I got with my biology degree. So I was a scientist continuing to walk in my faith. And, uh, you know, one of the things that brings to mind is this quote by, by uh, Albert Einstein. And it's, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It's the source of all true art and all science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger who could no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. And I just love that. Um, especially as part of my journey, you know, as a scientist, you know, wrestling with faith. But uh, so part of my uh, my journey, obviously, is involving me exploring just many aspects and expressions of my faith. In fact, even going uh, studying a few other faiths as part of my journey, you know, just to get my hands around this whole idea of what does faith mean. Um, during this time, I, I helped plant a church, and uh, I also made the we'll call it the now regrettable branding decision to start labeling myself the sinister minister. We all have a past. 
the saying. Uh, but the whole time I'm using my, my writing as a way to, to wrestle with uh, important questions, right? So, so what does it mean to be human? Uh, my, my, the first story I had published in Apex Magazine was called Broken Strand. And, and it was me just sort of wondering what it would look like if man was able to uh, genetic, genetically correct uh, our sin nature. Um, questions like, what is, what is our purpose? Um, uh, James alluded to uh, some of the stories in uh, Voices of Martyrs, where there's a story in there called The Valkyrie, uh, which is the first in a trilogy of stories that examines, again, this missionary work, what missionary work could look like in the future where people take the idea of the army of the Lord to a, to a certain conclusion. And that question is like, you know, what is truth? Uh, I had a story called uh, Awaiting Redemption, where I wonder, you know, what extremes one faith is willing to go to when they are convinced of their own rightness. And then also I began writing from this place of this intersection of, of faith and practice. Uh, at the time I was volunteering at a, a homeless teen ministry called uh, Outreach Inc. And, and it became the inspiration for my, my novel trilogy, The Knights of Breton Court, which is a, a retelling of the King Arthur mythos, except it's done through the eyes of homeless teenagers in Indianapolis. So that, that's kind of a, you know, it was, and that was back in the, I think that trilogy came out in 2010 which is a, a bittersweet moment for me because at the because faith is a journey, right? And it's full of peaks and, and valleys. And, and about at that same time, I was actually in a deep valley. Um, it was a, a, a place so dark, I didn't even think I'd see my way out of it, you know, uh, due to choices I'd made in my life. You know, my faith had been shattered, my life was in shambles. And, and I was trying to figure out, you know, frankly, how to put everything back together. And in the case of my faith, if I should even bother putting it all back together. You know, I kept coming back to this one question, you know, and, and the, a lot of ways I saw it as the central failing of my life at, at the time, which was, you know, what does my life say about my theology? You know, and I, and I just considered that that's just an important question, just keep asking myself on, on a regular basis, what does my life say about my theology? And then in trying to get to the core of what, what that meant, I, I kept coming back to uh, the, these couple of verses in, in the book of Matthew, this teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love your Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I was like, all right, I'm just gonna do that. I boiled down everything I thought about Christianity and all the theology is like, I'm gonna boil it all down. Love God, love one another. That's it. That's pretty much where I'm going to stay. Everything else is above my pay grade. Uh, and I just focused on that. Uh, you know, it, it, frankly, you know, I, you know, speaking theologically, it, it makes for a much simpler uh, exegesis if you, you know, for those troublesome pas passages. You know, I just interpret and filter all the parts of the Bible I, I don't understand, which are, you know, even many, many years into studying the Bible, there are more of those passages than, you know, I'm, I, I'd like to admit that I just don't understand. But I filter it all through that. That simple lens, love God, love one another. That impacts how I live my life today and it impacts how I dream uh, about tomorrow. Um, there's this quote from uh, Samuel Delaney, uh, which, which really resonates with me. And it's science fiction isn't just thinking about the world out there. It's also thinking about how that world might be a, a particular important exercise for those who are oppressed. Because if they're going to change the world we live in, they and all of us have to be able to think about a world that works differently. Uh, so uh, James alluded to the fact, so besides being a writer uh, and, uh, and working in, in a middle school, I also do a lot of uh, community organizing work at a place called the, the Kepra Institute. And, uh, and Kepra uh, bills me as their resident Afrofuturist which is great because most of the time no one even knows what that even means. So, you know, when we do that introduction and most people just stare and nod like they understand exactly what that means. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is like many organizations have futurists on staff, you know, and, and those would be folks who use their vision and their skill set to consider new alternatives or, or be guided, uh, you know, find ways to just navigate current circumstances. And, Futures, by definition, you know, look for new ways to examine how our society, our technology, and in, in the world, and, and and sort of extrapolate and create, you know, these blueprints and roadmaps to uh, innovate tomorrow. Um, some people call it strategic foresight thinking. However, I'm doing it through it with an Afrofuturist lens, and and that means all of that visioning is 
is rooted in black history and culture uh, to create this, to create a vivid picture of what the world could look like. And so by the strictures of my faith, you know, I, I, I believe in a future hope, right? Uh, you know, which is what I believe what, uh, is also a central tenet to what Afrofuturism is about. And so, you know, there's a lot of debates about, you know, about the label itself, but no matter what you call Afrofuturism, it, 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 it's the intersection of, of the black cultural lens with art and technology and liberation. Uh, it's the African diaspora, you know, creating this framework uh, to critique the past and, and dream of possible futures. You know, this bridge of creating past to the future. Um, Afrofuturism embraces the, the, the concept of Sankofa, which is a, a word in the Twi language, which, which means go back and get it, or it is not taboo to fetch that which is at risk of being left behind. Um, Janelle Monet, who I love Janelle Monet, um, she defines Afrofuturism this way, Afrofuturism is me us as black people seeing ourselves in the future being as magical as we want to be you know we get to paint a different world on our terms i get to be whatever i want through the lens of afrofuturism and so to me afrofuturism is the is the marriage of my faith and my social practice and my writing um if you're familiar at all with my work, uh, it, it's no secret that uh, world building is my favorite part of writing. Um, and I, in fact, I even remind my students that when I teach my, my world building workshops, you know, when it comes to creating world, you know, uh, religious faith is a real part of many people's lives. You know, religion infiltrates all corners of their lives and culture, uh, influencing everything from dress to language, to art, to thought, to social mores. And, and despite what, what some people may say or believe, you know, religious people aren't stupid. Uh, nor does a pursuit of a spiritual faith imply ignorance. Uh, part of what makes us human is our self-awareness and that same higher consciousness not only causes us to ask questions about our life and, and who we are, but it forces us to deal with the, the concept of our eventual death. And, and as people grapple you know, to relate to the universe and, and their place in it, you know, how we were created and why we were here, you know, we, we spin these casual narratives of, of natural events and you know, the, there are questions without answers that are still worth asking and exploring as people, you know, as we seek to find this sense of order in our lives and, and, and the sense of meaning in our lives. Which is a lot fancier than I intended to get because, I, I, because you know, what, another way of looking at it is world building is as close as, as I'm going to get to playing God, frankly, you know, we, why? because we, we start with a blank sheet of paper, a blank sheet of paper which means I can go anywhere from there. You know, the possibilities are endless. That, that blank sheet of paper, it, you know, I'm actually staring at one right now. That, that blank sheet of paper should awaken and stir our imagination. You know, it gives us room and space to dream, uh, to dream of, of who and, and what we could be. Uh, we get to model humanity. We get to create empathy. We get to, you know, we get to uh, you know, write all these different stories. We get to not only critique the world we live in, but we get to reimagine possible futures. And so I, I bring this all, uh, uh, tie this all back to my, my community organizing work, right? You know, in, in any struggle to break apart systematic baggage, you know, no matter where you find yourself or, or, or how you do it, what you're up against can loom large. And this battle can seem hopeless. And there are many, many dark nights of the soul when you lay awake wondering, you know, what's the point? And you're tempted to, to give up. But there's more to life than... There's more to life than survival. And, and part of what it means to truly live is to, is to have something to believe in. And the only thing that keeps you going is this idea of a living hope. And so this is where my work finds itself these days um, with, uh, with short stories like uh, At the Village Vanguard, which is uh, ruminations on Blacktopia, or uh, Ella's A Spaceship Melody, which is uh, well, one of my favorite uh, novellas, uh, which is about a starship and is powered by jazz music for reasons, because we, have a, because we start off with a blank page. So reasons, it's powered by jazz music, because I can. Uh, but it also features an AI wrestling with the idea of whether or not it has a soul. 
Um, and uh, we have my upcoming trilogy uh, comes out in March called Sweep of Stars. Uh, that's book one of the trilogy. And, you know, it leans into both the, the poem by Langston Hughes called Stars, as well as a Kendrick Lamar song um, uh, from the Black Panther soundtrack, All the Stars, because I, I'm, I'm dreaming of who and what we could be in the future, you know, to hopefully create Cass's vision of, of, of how we might get there on our terms. So uh, I'm, I'm still kind of uncertain on how to introduce myself uh, or my faith uh, and, and how best to describe, you know, how, how I move through life in search of truth. Uh, I was actually asked not too long ago, you know, what kind of Christian I am. Um, and, and I know that this person was trying to uh, find, the, you know, some sort of easy label to pin on me, you know, Baptist, Presbyterian, Calvinist, um, you know, just try to get an idea of where my theology is. And, uh, and I get called everything from a Christian Buddhist to a Christian humanist to a post-denominationalist. Uh, but I consider myself a, a simple theologian. Uh, so for me, the, the Bible comes down to a series of stories I use to shape and mold myself. And as I understand the overarching story of the Bible, it's one of God saying, I know you and I love you. And, and, and thus pursues a relationship with us. I know you and I love you. And then my life becomes a response to that. You know, I, I want to know God and pursue a relationship with them. You know, I want to follow Christ and model him and, and pursue relationships with others. Uh, I, I know that I'm, I'm called to love and I'm called to reconcile. I'm called to pursue justice. Uh, I'm called to leave the world a better place for me having passed through it. And, and I believe that God loves me. And, and in response to that, I in turn, you know, return that love and get caught up in this overflow of that love so that I, I endeavor to love others. You know, I'm getting to know you and, and have conversations. You know, my life uh, and, and my writing comes down to this practice, this continual practice of, of story. And I love hearing people's stories. Why, uh, one of the reasons why I edited an anthology called Dark Faith, which was all about you know, tell me your stories about faith. I don't care what your definition of faith is, but but tell me your your tell me your stories of faith. You know, I, I even love uh, encountering e each other as as stories, right? Bumping up against each other and, and connecting to each other as as fellow participants and, and co-authors into this greater story of reconciliation and healing. Uh, and so, what what this boils down to, or what this looks like, is, you know, if I and this is like for me and, and, and how I approach my life and, and my writing, you know, if I, if I don't challenge the paradigms of society, I have, I've missed the point of my calling. You know, if I, if I don't challenge the social constructs about me, I've missed the point of my calling. If I, if I don't challenge power dynamics, I, I've missed the point of my calling. If, if I don't challenge oppressive systems, you know, I've missed the point of my calling. And if I do not love you well, I have missed the point of my calling. Simple. Um, on, the, on the last day of Kwanzaa, uh, the principle we celebrate is uh, Imani, which means faith. Uh, and it means to believe with all of our heart in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and uh, in, the righteous, uh, in the righteousness and, and victory of our struggle. Um, and it too points uh, to a, a living hope that informs and, and infuses us. And, Sometimes life is about believing in the promise of, of how things could be, and and, and just a part of a, a just as part of recognizing our humanity is realizing you know what we deserve to simply be, no matter what that looks like. And so uh, our our goal as writers and, and as people of faith and as committed citizens, you know, might best be described as a as creating you know these possible utopias you know, our, our desired future states that end up invading our, our present. Or it could mean, you know, committing to this dream uh, that's waiting to be imagined into, into existence. You know, we write characters that embody new principles and, and ways of being and, and doing. We, we write characters that embody these new principles. We, we tell these stories of, of joy and thriving, you know, this promised land of what people uh, persevere towards. You know, we cast visions and paint pictures of, of what could be this, the, the, in fact, this is how I define my, you know, when I look at my middle school students, I, you know, I call them, I, I look at each individual, one of my students, and I, in them I see a multiverse of possibilities within, within each person's story. You know, this is the continued, the, the continued dream of, of the utopia, which, which creates these visions of, of future hope. 
and frankly, that hope keeps us from despair, you know, but, but in order to create radical change, you know, we have to be able to envision it. To create a space to imagine and dream of possible futures, uh, to join together to build a better, to, a, to build a, a better tomorrow together, you know, imagining pathways of, of healing in our future, which uh, as uh, author Tanana Reeve do, you know, what she calls us dreaming ourselves into the future is, is the first act of resistance. So I, I think back to uh, Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, which is, uh, you know, one of the, those prototypical books for me. It, it, it combines uh, issues of religion and, and social commentary, um, basically showing what faith in action looks like and, and what beliefs applied to community work looks like. And, and, and I always keep coming back to this quote. All that you touch, you change. All that you change changes you. The only lasting change, the only lasting truth is change. God is change. So go forth and be the change. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maurice, for uh, sharing your, so much of your story, your vision, uh, what it means uh, for you to be an author uh, in this genre, uh, your, your role, uh, and the connections between being an author and you know, the other things you try to do and the vision that you have for the difference you want to make in the world. Um, saw already so many connections between things that we're thinking about already in the first session. You know, the question of uh, stories like Octavia Butler's as prophecy and the role of creating a vision to uh, you know, social activism, to trying to change the world, inspire people to uh, say and do things that are different. I want to uh, encourage, I want, I don't want to, I, I could chat with you for ages, I'm sure <laughs> we will do have some back and forth, but I want to really invite, you know, the, uh, the presenters, the attendees, uh, to give them a chance to ask some questions, because one thing I'm aware of, uh, that I'm, you know, talking with people like you perhaps more often than most, I'm telling you the exception, that we write about science fiction quite a bit, but rarely are in conversation with the people who create these stories that we love. And that's one of the reasons why I thought it would be perfect to have, yeah, yeah, never mind, get, get some scholar who writes about this, who, you know, we'll have enough of that. Let's get somebody who writes science fiction to talk about what he does and uh, share that with us and hopefully answer some questions. So let me see. Um, I haven't seen any uh, questions directly appear in the chat. I'm sure I can come up with one, but let me at least start by inviting Yes, let's invite, uh, I, I like really to invite uh, panelists, uh, people in the audience uh, to join us on the screen also yeah. to give a sense of community if you are, uh, if you are eager to, to share your screen. Uh, uh, so both of you are eager to share the screen, uh, please uh, uh, raise the hand so that you, you can bring uh, you on the screen. I mean, even though you are not uh, <laughs> discussing or, as, or asking questions, but uh, Please join us. Yeah. Okay. Well, we do have a question in there, so I'll I'll let that go first. I'm I was afraid I was going to have to turn to my notes with the things I was thinking of asking. Uh, we'll get to those later if there's time. But uh, there's a, a question here, um, and I'm not sure whether uh, Janaba wants to ask it uh, in person. Uh, that would certainly be welcome. But the question is, how does world building affect the ways in which you are able to handle the reality of public school? especially in Indiana, if at all? Well, um, depends on what you mean by that. So I, I'd really love to invite the person yes. who asked the question to uh, expand on, on that a little bit. Um, because I could come at that from a, a several different ways, to be honest with you. Um, I, I do work at a, a private Christian school, which means it's a whole different uh, landscape uh, when it comes to navigating, uh, <laughs> well, parents. <sighs> which is its own thing. Um, but it, it's not so much uh, world building. I tell you what, so I wrote a book, uh, it was my first middle school book actually, it's called uh, the, the Usual Suspects. And, uh, and in that book, and I need to 
clarify for many reasons, this book does not take place in the middle school in which I teach. Yeah, now my boss will be happy. Um, but it, it, it features these two young black boys in a class because I, I run what's called the resource room. And, uh, and I work with a lot of kids who, were, who get labeled, frankly. And so, uh, and so, so premise of the book is whenever anything goes wrong in, in the school, they always round up the usual suspects, which are these students. And so this book becomes this, this meditation on, well, not meditation, but it, it becomes this, it follows this idea of like, what does it look like to try and navigate through the, these spaces with these labels, with all these prejudgments on you? Um, and, and this is a journey that starts in middle school. Uh, well, actually, it starts earlier than that. It's just this takes place in middle school, where you know these, I have many of my students who have to navigate or, or, or really come to terms with what it means to navigate this world with labels. And so, for me, uh, one of the things I always try, try to keep hammering home, in, and, and world building is it, which is we all need to own our blank pages. We all need to own our agency, and we can either live by this the by the rules of the world which have been built by others, or we can imagine our own world. We can imagine our own roadmaps through it. Uh, and so for me, it, it, it come, keeps coming back to this idea of what does it look like in this world that's been created to own your agency and to create your own pathways to, to navigate the world as best you can on your own terms. That we don't have to be subject to the rules of the world uh, well, we don't have to be subject to the rules of oppressive systems if, you know, we can reimagine our own pathways through it. But we have to begin by giving ourselves that, that room to dream about these possibilities of how it could be and what it could look like. Ho hopefully, I, hopefully I answered that question. You did indeed. And um, it's, it's one of those things that bless you for doing middle school, for one thing. And it's... <laughs> That is such an age group where where nothing is is right because you you know all the stuff but you can't do anything with it. Right. Um, but it, especially in this country, public education is such a a, a vice of um, the the ways in which people decide that you can and cannot do your job. And it's curious to me, especially to what what you were saying about uh, science fiction and the way that it allows you to dream into to what could be instead and um, that especially for a tent maker author uh, like you if that is both here's how I can think to, to do better in in my job and in, in the, the community organizing that you do um, but also that it's just a space where you can can hope that it that it gives you a, a place to say well maybe it's not going to be terrible <laughs> forever yeah. um, you know and, and if that if that sort of optimism that you can create that the godlikeness of world building yeah. if that then cycles back ah. into oh. what you're able to do so yes absolutely um, so so uh, for a start so my school actually has cut my hours uh, I only work to about one o'clock. And the reason for that is they say they want to give me room to write my stories and to dream about what it looks like uh, uh, to do community work out of this space. And so, uh, which I don't know if they knew what they were asking uh, for when they when they did that. So I mean, you get what you get. And so, like, uh, I, so it, within the first couple of weeks, it was. By the way, uh, I, I have this quiet goal of redefining the entire classical educational model and what that looks like. Um, hopefully you'll be along for the ride. And so that was in week one. In week two, it was, hey, the, the, the Paul Dunbar Library, the original Paul Dunbar Library actually is in our school building. What would it look like to restore that library um, and make that library not just a community facing piece, but also make it a, a site of a, a, an artist and writer's residency program and just do it out of the school uh, as a way for the school to uh, you know, be a part of directly impacting you know, the, the community we're in and, and, and the city that we're in. Um, and then by three, I, uh, by week three, I was like, well, so here's some of the programs we could run out of, out of the, uh, that space if we get that space going. So by week four, <laughs> my principal was like, and we're gonna redefine your job entirely. Next year, you're just doing that. You're, we're just releasing you to just go do that. We want you to do all that stuff. So, so yeah. So that world building piece, yeah. I apply it directly to where I am, uh, and in all the space I move in, what, when at all possible.
Sorry, I'm I'm the one who's uh, calling on people, aren't I? Yeah, um, I I've gotten I've attended so many things where Joshua does that that I forget sometimes it's my role. So Paul Levinson has his hand up there, and so uh, Paul, so glad you could be here. And uh, over to you. Hey, Paul. Well, hey, how you doing? Hi, Bruce. James, thanks for inviting me uh, to this uh, wonderful conference. I hope it's the first of many to come in the future. Uh, Maurice, I was, I was glad to hear you mention the Sparrow and, and how much uh, you, you liked it. I actually had some problems with it. I'm gonna be talking about that tomorrow. Okay. But, I, but the question I have for you is, I don't know if you noticed uh, way back when it was first published, there was a review in, I think it was the Library Journal, which said in effect, this is a wonderful novel, but don't call it science fiction because it deals with profound issues of good versus evil and philosophic discussions. And therefore don't demean it by calling it science fiction. And when I saw that, uh, I think uh, at that point, maybe I was vice president of the Science Fiction Writers of America. Uh, I almost wrote an angry letter to them, but I figured it wasn't worth it. But what's your response to uh, that point in the library journal? Yeah, the whole, like, that sounds like someone who completely misses the point of science fiction, right? I mean, I like science fiction is the domain of thinking about those kind of big ideas. I mean, that's like literally what we're called to do, <laughs> right? We are the genre of big ideas and, 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 and that idea of uh, uh, speculating and, 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 and extrapolating. And so I'm just like, that's literally what our genre is called to do is to wrestle with these big ideas. So yeah, that's just a person who misses the point of the genre, which I'm just like, you know what? If it was a star review, thank you for the star, and then I move on. <laughs> Well, I agree with you. That's a very good point about a starred review, even uh, even if the review itself doesn't make that much sense, at right. least it comes to people's attention. <laughs> anyway, thanks again for the great uh, talk. I enjoyed it. You're welcome. Thank you. So I know there's some other hands that have gone up. And so I know Joshua's going to take care of that and get those people here. Really? And uh, if, if uh, Let's see, so I see Miriam is here, and so um, we do, uh, we do, uh, yeah, you can go next. I think Will was waiting a much longer yes, time. We, already. we lost. Oh, that's right. Will is Will is here. Sorry, I saw the hand up and uh, immediately went to the hand. Um, but Will, I think, had his hand up earlier, so uh, we'll give credit to that. Thank you so much for that. And then Miriam, you're next after Will, so no need to wait for me to say anything else. Thanks, um, thanks, James, and um, thanks. Miriam, uh, I just wanted to say, um, Maurice, um, that was just absolutely wonderful. I'm, I'm um, speaking to you today from the lands of the Wathaurong people um, in Australia, uh, in the um, Geelong region of Victoria. Um, and I, I wanted to get your insights into, um, I guess, some of the ways in which uh, the narrative of colonialism um, has, has really um, devastated um, cultural um, and, and, and I guess, looking at ways of being able to, to use that blank paper you so eloquently talked about to dream of ways in which um, the, um, we could um, find a story that would be empowering um, without uh, getting lost in cultural appropriation. I, I, I recognise that I'm a cisgendered white male um, and so you know, I want to be a part of this story but also recognise that it isn't my story. Um, so I, I was interested in your views on that. Um, just before you answer that too, I, I do a podcast called uh, Deep Faith Nine, um, and I'm up to season four of Deep Space Nine. And uh, I also wanted to have it to find out how whether it would be possible for you to come on and talk to me about the episode two, which is called The Visitor, where Jake Sisko um, becomes a, a writer through time. Uh, and thought um, that might be fabulous. So you don't have to answer that now, but um, perhaps you could. Uh, we could be in contact about that. Oh yeah, definitely send me the email. Yep. Um, as for as for your, your question about colonialism, yeah, so that comes back to, so I, I mentioned my, my, my upcoming novel, Sweep of Stars. And, uh, and, and that question about colonialism was one I wrestled with for a long time. I think I spent, so the book comes out next, next it comes out in March. Um, I wrote it end of last year and into this year. And then before that, I spent probably a year and a half thinking through the book. 
um, thinking through what does it look like for Black people uh, from Africa as well as the diaspora to come together and establish an international, I mean, a, a interstellar community on our own terms, free of the shadow of, of colonialism. So it was a, both a process of how do we how do we do, get there, and then what is the implication of what that culture then could look like. Um, and so it was basically a year and a half of me dreaming and, and talking to a lot of folks uh, in, in my community. Um, and, I, and so like uh, the folks at the Kepper Institute, I, I would have conversations with them. It's like, all right, so let's phrase the question this way. All the things we're fighting for and all the things we, we, that we are looking to build, what does that look like? What does it look like if we win? You know, blank page. What, what does that look like? What, what are the structures that, that we, we uh, end up creating at that point. And, uh, and so that's, that's how I, you know, that was the mindset I, I set out to do, to, to write that book in. And then in talking to other black authors, it was a, the whole idea of like, what are the things we're looking at writing? And that question of, can we create futures free of colonialism where we aren't, where that's not even on the table, where we can just create history moving forward with, with out, outside that shadow. So the, the, it, it comes back to this longing that we have the storytellers of like, okay, <sighs> blank page, we can imagine different futures. Um, but it, it's also that, that idea of, you know, that, that we all have pasts. And so those pasts do still haunt us. And so we aren't, no matter what structures we come up with, we're, we're not creating them, was it uh, ex nihilo, is that it? I forget, uh, <laughs> but, but we're not creating it out, out of nothing. There is there is this the, the shadow that haunts us. Um, I'm reading a lot of Frantz Fanon right now, uh, what, uh, and, uh, and Audre Lorde, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, creating these structures, you know, how, how do we avoid creating the, uh, you know, how do we avoid, as we build new structures, not repeating the mistakes of the past? And uh, it's just something we continue to wrestle with, but the dream is there. And so this is my first attempt at it. Uh, with, with the novel, um, but even as I'm writing the novel, and I'm like literally, I'm writing book two as as as, as I'm sitting here, I'm writing book two, and I'm also writing a, a couple of short stories to go along with it. As I'm continuing to flesh out the idea in in, in different settings and and how people wrestle with different aspects of this, and, and what does that mean? And it's a lot. <laughs> that's, that's my, my that's my short answer. It's a lot, but it's what we're striving to do. It's definitely what I'm striving to do in my writing. Just quickly, I wanted to ask you too, um, um, how, how did you feel or what was your impression of that moment when uh, Benjamin Sisko lays Q out on the floor? Um, <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite lines <laughs> it's, it's, oh man. But, okay, I just love all of that, you know, especially when he's like, Picard would never have punched me. Hey, look, I'm not Picard. And that that right there said everything I need to know about Cisco in 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 one one sentence. Like I, I'm not Picard. It, it, it's almost like a, a meta statement to all, all fandom. I'm not Picard. Don't I'm I'm not going to operate the way Picard would operate. And uh, it's one one of the reasons why I love uh, Deep Space Nine so much. Yeah. Thank you, thank Will. You. Uh, and so now we'll go to Miriam. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maurice, for this really inspiring talk and a lot of what you said resonated with me especially the idea of you know that we have to imagine worlds in which we want to get to and the question of you know utopia is such a radical co um, concept and it's such a necessary concept um, and I was just kind of thinking on the one hand I see all the science fiction which is really creative really kind of breaking barriers and really envisioning things and on the other hand I feel like science fiction can be the most kind of short-sighted, narrow-minded genre I've ever seen. I mean, um, just see the Hugo and Nebula and whatever awards um, dealing with N.K. Jemisin. Mm -hmm. Like she's such an amazing writer and she really challenges um, all my ideas of, you know, what science fiction and fantasy should look like and what I feel about humans and whatever. Yeah, and she's who I want to be when I grow know up. How can she, yeah, and then <laughs> there are people um, being mad that she's winning it again and again and saying that it's, you know, kind of a, um, I don't know, something, conspiracy. And um, I'm kind of wrestling with this. I mean, it's even worse in Star Wars, of course, and even Star Trek. Like you have this really utopian and brave and, you know, um, questioning the structures and everything side. 
then you have that side which is all like oh no we have to keep it exactly the way it is and you have the whole word of god and canon and whatnot discussions and yeah i mean i'm, I'm sure you have to wrestle with this um how do you deal with that yeah um and do you have any ideas why there is this really weird span in science fiction especially yeah well i mean it's it's the same discussions that get had when people say, say well we're, we're tired of all these woke folks uh, interjecting their politics into our stories you know which is like well the politics have always been in stories it's just that the politics beforehand were the politics that you supported and, and supported you they were the politics of the status quo so of course you didn't notice them or complain about them uh, and so now we are in, you know, now we have people who are deliberately wrestling with the, and challenging the status quo, which, which, which you know, I love. And, and one of the things I, I love, uh, you know, talking about, you know, as a parent, I, I talk to my children, all the, uh, my boys uh, all the time about what it looked like to, like, there are these, there is a world around us. There are these rules that are in place. Uh, just know these rules weren't put in place to support us. So there are times when, guess what? We have to work around the rules uh, and knowing when and how to do that is an important life lesson and a continual conversation that, that we have in order to, like I said, own our own agency and navigate the spaces that we find ourselves in. Uh, I also, uh, you know, I also keep in balance the whole idea of, uh, you know, uh, Afrofuturism versus Afro-pessimism because, uh, you know, we do see the post-apocalyptic uh novels and and and, and stories and the, the dystopian visions but we have those stories for uh, uh which equally challenge the status quo frankly is they challenge and critique the status quo but uh but there are lessons that, that are in those stories too that they are lessons of of resilience and lessons of survival and and, and again navigating these spaces and so um you know i, I keep a lot of things in intention with, with, with one another to, to be honest with you and it's uh uh, I actually like that space of tension because, uh, you know, if I'm uncomfortable, it means I'm still thinking. So <laughs> that's the way I like to operate. So I like to be in that space. Great, thank you. Well, while we're waiting to see if anyone else has questions, um, and I may put one of our uh, earlier presenters on the spot if she's uh, interested in uh, com coming into the session, because I had some connections drawing in my brain. Uh, but I'm thinking about something that I hadn't really thought about quite this way before until I realized that I'm listening to a science fiction author who is also teaching in middle school. And I don't know why I hadn't really just thought before about the fact that every single franchise has an academy, at least one, right? You know, Starfleet Academy, the Jedi Academy, there's an Imperial Academy, Time Lord Academy. Uh, <clears throat> And yet I haven't really spent a lot of time looking at that. Of course, we only get glimpses most of the time, but given that you work in middle school, right? Um, a potentially dystopian context <laughs> that could either inspire or challenge. Uh, uh, yes, and there are others. Uh, and uh, if, we, if we branch out into fantasy and the things at the, the borderlines between them, there, there are still more, uh, but many of us, Right, who are presenting and involved in the conference are involved in higher education. Uh, whether it's less or more dystopian, uh, we can discuss that if there's interest. But I'm really interested to hear whether being a science fiction author and directly involved in teaching has given you any thoughts on the depiction of education in science fiction or the absence, or the, or the absence of a, a, a powerful vision that might inspire us to do something yeah. different. So. Remember, a year and a half I spent in conversation. <laughs> oh. And now the school day is officially done. Um, but a, a year and a half I, I spent it in conversation with folks. And, uh, and in this un in the universe I created, there's a, a place called the Thamai Academy uh, in, in my own world. Uh, it, well, not my world, but in, in the world that I created. Um, uh, and, and, and it's, a, and it's, the, it's through that academy that helps shape the, the stories of, uh, and, the, and the culture itself, you know, it, it's, it's what creates and, and generates the stories that, that reinforce the culture. Um, and so, but even then thinking through, you know, like I said, I've, I've written a lot of short stories and so uh, the, in this world too. And so I wrote a lot of short stories that, you know, talk about the development of this academy. And 
and how it's rooted in community, how, how it starts in community, because we have like, uh, uh, in fact, even at the Kepper Institute, we have our own internal library, that's a, this collection of books that we, you know, folks in the neighborhood can just come and, and read and study um, in, in these spaces. Um, collections, of, you know, this is a, a book collection that, you know, the library doesn't even have, the, our, our city library doesn't have access to. I mean, it's a pretty uh, curated uh, collection of books. Which is great because people just don't think to, that, hey, you know, in this, you know, quote unquote, troubled neighborhood, there is a library at the center of the neighborhood. Um, a library which uh, takes educate, which educates people outside of the, the, the educational system, because a lot of us, the educational system has given up on. And so people find themselves uh, in, in the community coming back to this neighborhood resource of, of books and studying on, on their own terms and studying uh, within community. Uh, so we have like these uh, neighborhood book studies uh, and, and book discussions. And, and it's just watching this in play where uh, I start thinking through, well, this is how education could work, you know, because the, the educational model we have is, is broken. I can see that with my students. I, I see that with how my sixth graders love reading. And then by eighth grade, uh, you know, they don't want to pick up a book anymore. You know, there's something that goes on in, in, our, in our process that, that kind of stamps out the, the love of, of the stuff that I love to do, like reading and writing. So how, how do we how do we address it? How do we rekindle that love? Um, I also see how there are some types of students, and I'm thinking of my youngest son in particular, for whom this the educational model that is just not not for him. Uh, and the, the, the system was just not the, the system was uh, the, so the way I look at it in terms of like me parenting, for example, and I have two boys and my oldest son, he loves to learn your rules. He loves to learn the rules of your system because once he learns the rules, he can figure out how to bend the system to his will. That's just how he navigates the world. My youngest son could give a crap about your rules and he's just gonna stomp through the world on, on his terms, which, and I love, I love that about each of them and I nurture that in each of them. It didn't mean I had to go to a lot of parent teacher conferences though. So that, that's the drawback. Man, I'm far afield on, on your question. But <laughs> anyway, but part of it is, is the fact that, you know, I think a lot about education and what that looks like. I think a, a lot about, uh, like, even when I'm dealing with my own students, it's like, I have a curriculum, we, we have uh, 250 students to come to, to our school, which means, frankly, I have 250 curricula in place, because I have to deal with each of this, these students on their own terms based on who they are, and, and how they're coming at the universe. And, and, and that's, how I, that's how I do education, I, and, uh, which is why I tend to get a lot of troubled students sent to me because they're like, all right, go see Mr. Broadus. And so I end up walking one-on-one -on -one with students, which not a, lot of, not a lot of school systems have that built in where they can allow people to just walk one-on-one -on -one with students and, 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 and help them through their day or help them through their coursework or help them uh, <laughs> come at the world, you know, frankly. But yeah, it's something I, I, that is near and dear to my heart and I think a lot about. And I build it into a lot of my worlds, you know, moving forward. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm actually thinking about, you know, I hadn't really thought about it in these terms either. But, you know, if you think about somebody like Jesus in a context in which, you know, there isn't widespread literacy, you know, and people gathering around him to hear stories and wisdom and get interpretation of the scriptures mediated, you know, that, you know, people like that actually, in, in some sense, were like a community library. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and he's kind of like a traveling community library. Right. Um, yeah, I'm gonna to have to let that thought sit with me and uh, yeah, see what I'm, happens. I'm doing the same thing. I'm just um, like thinking through a yeah, lot of this. <laughs> yeah, it's like jot down frantic notes and hope that uh, later I can make sense of them and uh, the, the thoughts are still meaningful. <laughs> yeah, the other thing I was hoping I might do is uh, if um, Maria Dorfler is still uh, out there uh, among the uh, participants, but not on screen and is interested in doing so, and she may have had to leave. I know that some of our presenters had uh, courses uh, and teaching responsibilities and other things. But just, uh, she talked about uh, Karin uh, Tidbeck's uh, Amatka, which is really all about a fictional world in which there is this, I, I think goop might be the technical term actually, but which takes shapes based on people labeling it, right? And so the settlers have found themselves on this world where there's this stuff that it can be paper, can be suitcase, can be whatever. But if you stop assigning it that role, then it loses its form. And it, it 
uses this thing, this scenario at the border of science fiction and fantasy to uh, look at both the power of labeling to create, but also the power of challenging labeling to make us realize that what our labels describe may not be something as fixed as we imagine it to be. Yeah. And so I was hoping that uh, she might be interested in uh, coming back in with some some thoughts on that novel because she's dug into it more than I have. I read it when I saw that she was going to be presenting on it because I thought, well, I don't want to be out of my depth in the discussion. But I'm really interested because I uh, was thinking about that when when you talked about labeling, right? And of course, labels have have power potentially, right, to do positive things, but also have power to to destroy and. And for all the emphasis in traditions like Taoism on the limitations of language to describe and to do justice to the world, can't see we can't seem to do without them. You know? And so I guess the question is, you know, how does how do sci-fi and education together yeah. you know, allow us to come up with new labels, right? Labels that may have never existed before and find them, um, challenge labels that do harm and things of that sort. Right. Uh, you know, honestly, the, the thing that I think of, besides being distracted by whether or not the MCU has an academy, and I would argue that it's going to introduce one, probably through the X-Men, because the New Mutants were Charles Xavier's academy. But that's me going down a rabbit trail. Yeah. But the other thing uh, I thought about, well, I mean, to your point about labels, I, I was thinking about, there, there's an issue of Sandman, Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Um, and I can't remember what, what the, where... I can't remember the exact issue, but I remember the quote because the quote has always stuck with me. And it was, it's easy to let a bad story get inside you. And, and that's what labels are. Well, that's what the, these destructive labels are. When, when I think about how, how kids are essentially profiled in schools um, and then they are given this label and then the teachers all treat them as the label, not at, they lose sight of the student, they only see the label and they only deal with the label and thus often missing the, the actual person in front of them. Um, so that's that's the response for uh, you know, how, how teachers end up coming at it. But for the student, it's easy to let a bad story get inside you. Um, I remember when I was coming through the school system, um, uh, it, it was in fourth grade, actually right when I got to Indianapolis, uh, they wanted to put me, when I was graduating, when I was leaving fourth grade, they wanted to put me in remedial courses. And, uh, and my mother was just like, no, you've not met my son. Well, but we have, but he's in this class. Here's his label, da, 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 da. So we're gonna put him in remedial courses. And so she fought to get me, test. she like test him, test my son. Um, and this is actually, this is a story I only uh, found out only a few months ago, to be honest with you about, about this whole thing. And so she fought, they had me retested or had me tested. And then they were like, came back with, oh, we're gonna put him into the accelerated program. I'm like, oh. Okay, so I had no idea that's how I got into the accelerated program, but my brother didn't. He went on through the, the, the traditional program and then we noticed that when he hit fifth grade, his trajectory in school went into a different direction. And we just thought, oh, well, you know, he's just not built for school, blah, 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 he just doesn't like it, what have you. Then my, my cousin comes up uh, a few years later, hit, comes to the same teacher and then all of a sudden his school trajectory changes. And then, so now we're like, wait, now that's interesting. Well, come to find out this teacher pre-labels black boys. As soon as black boys come into her class, she labels them and uh, has no expectations of them. Uh, they are people waiting to be fed into the, uh, the criminal justice system. So she just doesn't bother dealing with them. And so there's no expectations of them and she treats them accordingly. And then because of that label, uh, that's how she reacts. But then that that story got inside them. That story got inside them. And then they acted. So the rest of their school career from then until through high school, that was what they lived into was that society has already given up on me. Um, and it wasn't until after high school that my brother uh, was able to, well, he ended up joining the Marines and suddenly now there's a new story entirely <laughs> that's, that's being written into him as, as a Marine. But yeah, it's easy to let a bad story get inside you is what I keep coming back to when, when it comes to these labels. That's that's a great quote. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Gabriele, saw your hand. I'm not, I, I would like, I'd be more very interested to know even more about your creative uh, process. Uh, so in your experience, uh, what comes first? Uh, a sort of sci-fi scenario that then you filled with your uh, 
theological uh, interest, etc., or uh, or just the opposite. You start first uh, from uh, some questions, uh, uh, and then you imagine uh, a, a a sci-fi scenario. And and a second question that is related to this: uh, if if a kid, uh, if a child will ask you, uh, would be interested in writing a sci-fi uh, story. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend him or her to do first? So to imagine uh, a sort of uh, 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 imaginative scenario, sci-fi scenario, and then uh, and then you will guide the child to um, to ask himself or herself all the questions that are implied, or uh, to start instead from some uh, of uh, his or her own questions. Yeah. of the present okay uh so first question you know, uh where, where do i start um it, it varies from project to project mm -hmm. um there are times uh like with the novel uh pit my airship for example there, there were two things going on with that there was one me uh answering the question of uh what a steampunk version of Indianapolis would look like if America lost the Revolutionary War and remained a colony of England? Because that's a question that people often find themselves asking. Um, and, but there was that. But then there was also the big, the big question I was wrestling with at the time was, you know, I'm a I'm a writer. How do I use that gift to affect any sort of change in community? Mm -hmm. And so, I created that world, but wanted to answer that question in that world. Um, just like with the uh, sweep of stars, it, it actually began with me creating this world. I, I wanted to, I built this world and then I was like, okay, now I got to figure out a story to tell in this world. You know, and I've, I built the machine now how, and I got to get the machine to run. Uh, so uh, where do I find some conflict and stick some characters in it? Uh, so it, it, it kind of depends. Uh, although it does sound like I start with world building and, and actually probably nine times out of 10, I do start with world, world building because I love just building uh, new worlds. Mm -hmm. um, but then sometimes I just have a character that I just love and I, uh, that, that springs into my head and I'm just like, all right, I just want to run around and see what this character gets into and, and let's just see what happens. Um, now with students, on the other hand, students are, it, it's interesting work, work with, uh, with, with students when it comes to writing. Um, because so actually what I end up doing is I just take my fingers off in a lot of ways, because if I give a, if I give a student a blank sheet of paper and just say, tell me a story, they got no problems telling me a story. Um, it, uh, which again points to how do we teach, how do we teach these things? Because in a lot of ways, I feel like we're teaching the, the exact opposite. We're squashing their love of writing that they would just naturally want to do. Because let me tell you, my students are born storytellers. And by that, I mean, they can lie in a minute uh, they need no prompting to spin a grand tale of of why it was this thing mysteriously broke, and the, you know they'll bring in all sorts of world building elements. Uh, and my favorite was when one student brought in ninjas. I'm like, really ninjas? Like, uh, Mr. Prodigy, you don't understand. You know, this is a ninja filled environment that we live in. I'm like, okay, you know what? Tell me all about it. Um, and so for me, working with students is a lot about you know what I want you to just any ideas on the table. You give me any idea as the first draft, <laughs> and then we'll go through. And let, now let's let's see what it means in terms of storytelling. Let, let's let's hone this into a story. Story, um, but yeah, with students, yeah, it's uh, so that's that's my general approach to it. But then you know, I've had a couple of mentees because um, uh, because apparently my middle schoolers decide they never want to leave me, and so in high school I've taken some of them on as mentees. What I ended up doing, honestly, I just end up writing a story with them. It's like, hey, let's co-write a story together, and let's just see what it, what is uh, what that looks like. And uh, because I know, because because like I said, there comes a point where they the system itself has taught them all sorts of not very good things about how to write stories. So I was like, no, 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 that's how school tells you how to write a story. Uh, I write stories based on my need to get paid for things. So that's a whole different way I, I come at stories. So uh, let, let's, do, let's do this. And so we'll write stories together um, and we'll, we'll do that, you know, me one-on-one -on -one with somebody or even a small group, hey, let's, let's create a story together so that we just work through it 
together uh, you know, so they can see what the process looks like. Because the process is always, you know, always messy. I never know where it's going to go, but that's part of the fun of it for me. And so we'll just turn it into a bit of a game and just let's just have fun, uh, which is why I try to keep coming back to I enjoy this. This is what I'd love to do. And, you know, so a lot of me teaching is just sharing my joy of what I love to do. Thank you. Uh, Miriam, saw your hand there. Yeah, thank you. If I may, I have another question or one and a half or something. Because um, I saw Will Nicholas' um, wallpaper, which is, of course, the, the picture of this conference with the kind of churchy windows depicting Star Trek and Star Wars. And um, I very much love, I think they're very beautiful, those windows. But on the other hand, I'm reminded that, you know, some fans really do take these uh, worlds as kind of a religious thing or a quasi-religious thing. And um, especially in Star Wars, I've, um, I've once done a, um, an exam. I took an exam, um, which was, uh, yeah, anyway, from a pastoral training where I kind of uh, thought about, you know, the, the religious aspects of Star Wars and the force in Star Wars, but also, you know, just the, the way, the fact that these are myths, these stories, and, you know, they're kind of trying to do the same that the Bible did maybe or something like that. And um, so I think actually it might be two questions. I'm really tired. It's really late here, very dark already. Um, so um, I was kind of wondering on the one hand, um, I think my question goes to um, how do you feel about using or inventing religions mm -hmm. for or religious systems in a um, science fiction work? And on the other hand, um, my question is, are certain works of science fiction do they have some religious aspects or are they even, um, yeah, science fiction, uh, re religions themselves? I mean, like the Dark Over books from Marion Zimmer Bradley, where even, you know, people kind of adopted some things there as something like a religion or whatnot. Mm. So, yeah. Oh, man. Um, all right. I'm going to pass on that second question because there's a lot there uh, that I am thinking about right now. The whole idea of fandom as religious zealots is a perfect connection and so i was like oh so what's the implication of that so my brain is like sort of working backwards uh in terms of that because i think there's a lot there um oh man oh man then that makes the movies the religious texts and then fandom a series of missing the point of their own faith in a lot of ways so yeah there's a lot of there's a lot i could do with with, with that uh uh that image so uh uh, those are my initial surface thoughts, but yeah, that's one I would, oh, that's worth a, a whole paper right there. Um, but the whole idea of inventing, inventing religions is, is lovely. Is that, I don't know uh, if that's a, the proper academic term, but uh, I, I love the idea. I love the idea. In fact, in fact going back to even uh, Octavia Butler's uh, Parable of the Sower, it, it's about an invented religion. Um, and uh, and it springs from, you know, she, her, her family raised her in the church. Her family was deeply, uh, deeply churched. Um, and so that, that upbringing informs that faith, but it's also, you know, that was also a faith she rejected at the same time. But that doesn't stop her from creating this faith that, uh, that is basically going to become the significant healing factor of, of the world that she, she's creating. And so, for me, the, the sort of a blank page when it comes to, to religion, uh, you know what it does? It allows us to explore this idea of, you know, what is the point of religion? What, what is the point of our faith? Um, and sometimes we can only do that sort of examination by taking us, ourselves out of the context of our faith and, and looking at it through this different lens. And so that, that's kind of where I would come at with the idea of, uh, of in, in, uh, creating the, these faith. And, and you can also do critical work through that same lens, uh, do, doing the same sort of work, because, you know, how does faith get abused? That, there, that's also um, something worthy of examination, frankly, you know, starting with cults of personality and, uh, or again, back to missing the point of the very tenets that we say we believe in. Okay, well, we're getting close to the end of uh, time here. And so uh, if there aren't any other questions, and I don't think there are, uh, this is probably... 
We listen is there to one? We... There is one more. Okay. Will, my back, my oh, background will, will be so so colorfully dynamic that you're missing. Can't see my hand, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, right. I just wanted to push. I mean, I I I I felt the um, complexity and discomfort of the the whole question about narrative um, and and religious creation and creation of religious tradition, but. I mean, I've been listening to the podcast um, by Christianity Today called the, the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, and there's, there's a whole dynamic in that that actually talks about the way in which, uh, 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 you know, a, 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 a fictional narrative can be generated within a real circumstance, and, and that leaves entire communities open to a real sense of abuse. So I guess I just wanted to push a bit further on that and say, well, what happens when we can't work out who is the dreamer and who is the dreamer? No, I've, I've been uh, reading articles on that same thing. And it's one of those things which is just uh, honestly just in, in some way just too painful to watch, especially because that was the era I was really in, uh, deeply involved in ministry work and church planting work. I was in that era. Um, and then watching the churches uh, I was a part of just be so caught up in that. And then me wondering if I was in the twilight zone, honestly, come just like, Nothing, nothing about what's going on feels right. Is it me? And, uh, you know, just feeling lost in that, uh, which was one of the reasons why I ended up leaving the church. I was just like, something about this is all just off. And I don't know if it's me. And so I end up dropping out because of that. But that, so that's why I kind of bounce with that story, which is because I'm like, no, that story still is so close to home for me and was formative in a lot of ways and actually helped inform some of the churches I ended up being a part of planting moving forward. Because I'm just like, how do we keep coming back to the story that actually, how do we figure out what is the actual story and, and what we're actually supposed to be about? And, and that's not a static process. I mean, that's not a static thing. It's not like, oh, okay, we found it and now we're done. No, some, we have to keep, keep coming back to that story. I think that is the power of ritual is to remind us of what our original story is and, and to keep, you know, to guide us back to that, that true North. Um, because it's easy to have uh, mission drift. It's easy to fall into cults of personality. It's easy to get caught up in one aspect of theology and then suddenly find yourself completely lost, you know, down the road. So, yeah, that's, yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for well, I, that. I, I, I'm sorry, sorry for pushing that into an awkward space, but I, I guess that's why that episode um, Far Beyond the Stars is so profound in Deep Space Nine, because in a sense, it takes seven years of narrative and then actually makes you question whether or not the seven years exists or the one episode exists. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the, 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 the profound place that science fiction can place us in, which has great opportunity and massive threat at the same time. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll stop typing my comment then and say it since I'm going to also draw things to a close, but was going to say that uh, for those who mention uh, their own publications and things like that uh, that come up, uh, feel free to drop a link to those on like Google, uh, Google Drive or Dropbox if you have a way of sharing that way. And then uh, share those with uh, everyone if they come up in conversation with everyone and you're willing to do that. Um, if not, then you can share them with a, a few people, right? And um, if that's not working, then there are other ways that uh, you can get them to me and I can pass them along. Um, so it depends whether one wants to get them to, to everyone, to presenters, to an individual. But if there's anything I can do to help with that, uh, one great thing that sometimes happens at conferences is that things get shared. And one great thing that contributes to a, a utopian future in which we kill fewer trees is that we can sometimes just pass along a link to digital versions of things. So thank you. Uh, this has been a great first day. We are not done with the conference yet, although we are wrapping things up for today. Um, and it is remarkable, given that we are a group of people who work in education, uh, that we did not go over our time or past uh, bells or have to be dragged off of the floor, but uh, our wrapping things up with a few minutes to spare. Uh, that's, that's always nice. Um, and of course it has been a long day and for some it's really late or really early. And so uh, we're looking forward to everyone being back tomorrow. Uh, the last thing I want to say other than thanking all of today's presenters and especially uh, Maurice for his 
you know, for a wonderful keynote and for just being available to uh, talk with us about being an author and uh, what science fiction and fantasy and uh, Afrofuturism and all these uh, different related genres that we write about and think about and enjoy and consume uh, mean to you. And to bring your, your own theological education and perspective to bear on some of the things that we're talking about and some of the things that you, you read about as well as what you write. Uh, tomorrow morning um, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, precisely at noon uh, for those who are in Eastern Standard Time, uh, we will start off with uh, an introduction and recap. Uh, this is something that's become uh, sort of a par for the course element in Enoch seminar meetings. And it's, it's a wonderful feature there. Uh, it's never just, oh, here's what we did yesterday in case you missed it. Although we will provide that for those who missed it. And so do tell people who had to leave early that, uh, or had to arrive late that they have a second chance at a brief summary. But we really do talk about uh, what happened the day before. And oftentimes after having had a chance to reflect on it, when we recap, we really are thinking about the significance and the connections and things like that. And so in the past, we found that those times are really rewarding. That said, as you've already realized, if the conversation is enough and people are tired, we will give you a break and then come back and reconvene at the next scheduled start time. So any other announcements, either from Joshua or from anyone else? I don't have any other announcements. This was a great day with wonderful sessions. So thank you so much again to the speakers. I look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow at noon. Yeah, thank you all and see you back here tomorrow if you can make it. Thank you so much.